Hello everyone, welcome to the video on complex numbers. We are going to be discussing how to express square roots of negative numbers in terms of i, the imaginary unit. We're going to talk about adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing complex numbers. And we're going to talk about simplifying powers of i. So let's go ahead and get started first with um, just kind of the formal definition of what a complex number is. Uh, the, the set of all numbers of the form a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers. So a is a number that you would find on the real number line, and b is also a number found on the real number line. And then i is what we call this imaginary unit. We'll define i here in a second. Um, but this sum in general, a plus bi, the entire thing here, this is what we call a complex number. A is said to be the real part, and B is said to be the imaginary part of the complex number. Um, now notice, you know, you see this entire sum if B is not zero. Um, but notice what would happen if B is zero. If B equals zero, we would have A plus zero times I, which would be A plus zero, which is just A, a real number, an element of the set of real numbers. So really, we could think about the complex numbers as kind of an expanded form of the real number line. In other words, the set of complex numbers, the set of all things that are written a plus bi, is kind of the larger set surrounding the set of real numbers. And another way of saying that is the set of real numbers is a subset of the set of complex numbers. So all the real numbers of the number line are contained within this set of imaginary numbers. Now, what is this value i? The value i is said to be um, an imaginary unit, and it is formally defined as the square root of negative 1. Uh, hence, kind of the wording imaginary. Um, it's not a real number, right? We can't take the square root of any value, let alone the square root of um, a negative number, right? Square roots are only defined for um, positive, non-zero uh, integers and real values. So the square root of anything negative is, is technically imaginary because it's not real. Um, at the very least, the square root of negative 1, the unit, is definitely going to be an imaginary number. Now, if we square this value, notice what happens. If I square i, that means I'm really squaring the square root of negative 1 and the square root squared. You know, those two are inverse operations. They undo each other, and we're left with just the value negative 1. So this is going to be an identity that we use later on um, in this video. So kind of long story short, this is, this is how we're thinking about the set of, of complex numbers. We are saying that it is an expanded system of numbers in which the square roots of negatives are defined. And they are defined by this imaginary number i. It's going to be the basis of our set. Um, so here's technically how we're going to, to work with them. You'll notice that I've got um, kind of a a breakdown or a general guideline of, of how to express complex numbers in terms of this imaginary unit i. Um, so imagine that b is a positive real number. So let's say, uh, for example, that b is equal to 3. Then how do we express something like the square root of the opposite of 3, which is negative 3 or negative b? Well, we can always break a negative value down into negative 1 times the number. So negative 3 is the same thing as negative 1 times 3. Well, in this little um, setup right here, uh, we can imagine the rule about products coming into play inside of root uh, symbols. If we've got the square root of a times b, well, that's going to be the same thing as the square root of a times the square root of b. So the square root of the product negative 1 times 3 is really the same thing as the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 3. Hence, what I have written right here, the square root of negative 1 times the square root of whatever that value b is. Well, notice that this is exactly how we defined our value i. This is kind of the formal definition of that imaginary unit. The square root of negative 1 is equal to i. So we're just literally replacing that symbolism with the variable i, 
and then we still have the square root 3, and equivalently this can be written as the square root of 3i. So i almost acts like an x or a y, um, just kind of like a, a variable. It's always written to the right of the coefficient. So that's going to be kind of the general way that we work with our imaginary unit. So we'll do a couple of examples to get used to writing numbers in uh, the complex number system. Again, they are written in the form a plus bi. Um, just having the value a means that we're in the real number system. The entire sum is the complex number. A could be zero, so we might just have a product with i. Um, but anything that is written of this form is technically a complex number. So again, it can be a whole number a, or it could be a sum a plus bi, or a could be zero, and maybe we're just talking about a multiple of i. Technically, all of these values are complex numbers. Uh, if it's just a, we say that that's a real number. If it's the sum or you know the multiple of i, we say that those are complex numbers. But technically, they are all part of this system. So let's go ahead and do some examples. We'll, we'll switch colors to, to do different parts here. So part a, I'll do in pink, the square root of negative 64. Uh, per our uh, kind of formal definition above, we could say that this is the same thing as the square root of negative 1 times 64 which is the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 64. And the square root of negative 1 is how we define this imaginary unit i. So I'm going to replace that with i. And then the square root of 64 we know to be 8. So this is the same thing as 8i for part a. OK, new color. Let's do part b in purple. So part b, we're looking to write the square root of negative 48 as a multiple of i or as a complex number a plus bi. So let's break this one down. This is the same thing as the square root of negative 1 times 48, which is the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 48. And I know the square root of negative 1 is how I'm defining i, but 48 is not a perfect square. So I got to work on this one a little bit using my factor tree. 48 is the same thing as 4 times 12. 4 and 12 are not prime. They break down again as 2 times 2 and 4 times 3. 2 is prime, 2 is prime, but 4 breaks down again as 2 and 2. And then we've got that 3. So the square root, the square root of 48 is the same thing as the square root of 2 to the 4th times 3. Well, two pairs of two are going to come out. So this is the same thing as four square roots of three. So replacing the square root of 48 with four square roots of three, that gives us the complex number four root three i. And again, I usually write i uh, to the right of the number, just as you would a variable x or y or z. Um, it, it's just convention that we write you know, the coefficient out front. OK, a couple more examples here. I'll do part C in blue. Here I've got the opposite of the square root of negative 300. The opposite of the square root of negative 1 times 300. Well, that's going to be the opposite of the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 300. And this is going to be the opposite of i times the square root of 300 which 300 is not a perfect square, so that's another one that I have to break down a little bit. 300 is going to be uh, 30 times 10, which is 5 times 6 times 5 times 2. And 5 is prime. 6 will break down again as 3 and 2. And then we bring the other prime factors down. So 300 is the same thing as 5 squared times 2 squared times 3. So the square root of 300 is going to be the square root of those factors, which breaks down as 5 times 2 times the square root of 3, or 10 square roots of 3. So over here in my problem where I've got the square root of 300, I'm going to replace that with its equivalent form, 10 square roots of 3. So our, our final answer here will say this is equal to um, the opposite of 10 square roots of 3i. All righty. And one more. Let's do green. So part D. Part D is in green. 20 
plus the square root of negative 5. Okay, here we're seeing that component A show up in the complex number, right? I could have a multiple of I, which is BI. I could have a multiple of I, and then I could also have this real component to it um, that's part of the sum. So here, 20 is acting like A, and I've got to work on this square root of negative 5 to write it as a multiple of I. So this is the same thing as 20 plus the square root of negative 1 times 5, or 20 plus the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 5. And again, the square root of negative 1 is how we define the imaginary units. So this is going to be 20 plus square root of 5i. And in this problem, we really see that full complex number form show up, a plus b i. A is the real part, B is the imaginary part. Bo both A and B are real numbers. 20 is a real number, the square root of 5 is a real number, um, but in full sum here, 20 plus the square root of 5i, there we're seeing kind of the, uh, the whole thing come together. It's not just a multiple of this imaginary unit, it is also potentially the sum of some other real number. Okay, so how do we work in the complex number system, right? We, we kind of understand, you know, pretty well how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide in the real numbers, but how do we add, subtract, multiply, and divide in the complex numbers? Um, well, it's actually not very complicated. Um, to add two complex numbers together, we simply add their real parts, right? So A plus BI in that number, A is the real part. In C plus DI, C is the real part. So to add the complex numbers together, we're going to add the real parts, and then we're going to add the imaginary parts. So in A plus BI, uh, B is the imaginary part. In C plus DI, D is the imaginary part. So we add the imaginary parts together, and we write them as the coefficient to the imaginary number I. Um, not too much different when we go to subtract, right? We look at the real parts, A and C, and we subtract them. We look at the imaginary parts, B and D, and we subtract them. Um, but notice that the symbol in the middle keeps the form of the, of the complex number. It is still some A plus B, I. So notice that the symbol here in between these two differences is still the addition symbol. It is still in this a plus b i form because little a minus little c, that's going to be some real number. And little b minus little d is still going to be some real number. But the symbol in the middle here is still going to be a summation. Okay, so let's do some examples, both adding and subtracting real numbers here. So uh, part a, the complex number negative 9 plus 2i minus the complex number negative 17 minus 6i. We're going to put the real parts together, so negative 9 minus a negative 17. Uh, symbol in the middle is still addition. And then we're going to subtract the imaginary parts, 2 minus negative 6, and this is the coefficient in front of i. So add the opposite here and we will have 8, add the opposite here and we will have 8 again, and the complex number in a plus b i form is 8 plus 8i. Eight okay, number 2, this time we are adding two real num or two complex numbers together, so we're going to add the real parts, negative 2 plus 4, and we are going to add the imaginary parts, 6 uh, plus, now right here, there's nothing technically written, but it is, you know, a coefficient of, of 1 sitting in front of that i. So really we're going to be adding a negative 1 here, and that will be our imaginary part of the complex number. So negative 2 plus 4, we've got 2, and 6 plus a negative 1, we've got 5. So the complex number sum here is 2 plus 5i. All right, let's do another addition problem. 5 minus 2i plus 3 plus 3i. Add the real parts together, 5 plus 3, and then add the imaginary parts together, negative 2 plus 3, and that's the coefficient sitting with our imaginary unit i. So we've got 8 plus 1i. Uh,
or just 8 plus i. One more and then we'll move on to multiplying and dividing. Here we're going to subtract again. So again, pick out the real parts. 2 and 12 we're subtracting. The sign in the middle is still going to be an addition sign. We're writing this in A plus B I form. And then we're going to subtract the imaginary parts. 6 minus a negative 4 I. So 2 minus 12, we're going to add the opposite. That's negative 10. 6 uh, minus a negative 4 is the same thing as 6 plus 4, so 10. Our complex number is negative 10 plus 10i. Alrighty, now let's talk about multiplying complex numbers. Um, because the product rule for radicals only applies to real numbers, we cannot multiply radicands willy-nilly. Any time that we are performing operations with square roots of negative numbers, and if you need to highlight this, in your notes, in your handout, in, your, in the uh, PDF that goes along with this video. If you need to highlight this, please do so. We cannot multiply radicands together because if I multiply two radicands that are negative, I'm going to get a radicand that is positive and then suddenly my square root uh, symbol can be performed. We can't work that way in the real number system. We're working with complex numbers here. So we want to first turn everything in terms of I and then go about with the operation. So again, if you need to start this, please do this. Uh, when performing operations with square roots of negative numbers, we have to first put everything in terms of I. So let's do a couple of examples where that happens. We'll start uh, with the square root of negative 16 times the square root of negative 4. First work with the square root of negative 16. This is the same thing as the square root of negative 1 times 16, which is the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 16, or 4i, right? The square root of negative 1 is how we're talking about i, and we know that 16 is a perfect square, it's 4. Then work with the square root of negative 4. This is the same thing as the square root of negative 1 times 4, or the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 4, or 2i. So both of them, we work both of the factors of this product separately, transforming them in terms of the imaginary unit i first. Now I can actually do the multiplication here. 4i times 2i is going to be 4 times 2 is 8. i times i is i squared. Now this is going to employ that, that property that we talked about earlier. i squared is the same thing as the square root of negative 1 squared, which is negative 1. So I can actually replace this i squared with the real number value negative 1. So what we actually have here is 8 times negative 1, or negative 8. Let's do some more. Let's multiply these two complex numbers together. Negative 6i times 3 minus 5i. Now notice that I said both of these are complex numbers, even though this one uh, does not technically look like an a plus bi. It really is, because in this instance, a is 0. Uh, so if it makes you feel better, you could rewrite this as 0 minus 6i or 0 plus a negative 6i if you want it to have this look to it. Um, but it's not necessary to do the multiplication. We just need to recognize that it is a, a complex number, a true um, a plus bi value. But anyway, we're just going to proceed um, like we do with the distributive property of real numbers. We're going to take this negative 6i and multiply it through the quantity. So we'll have uh, negative 6 times 3 is negative 18, and then our coefficient is in front of our variable i. And then we'll have negative 6i times negative 5i, and negative times a negative is a positive 30. i times i is i squared. But we're not done because we know that this actually simplifies to negative 1. So negative 18i plus 30 times negative 1, this will give us a negative 30. So we've got negative 30 minus 18i. Notice that I, I can switch it around because addition is commutative. So to kind of put it in the, the proper a plus bi form, I would maybe say negative 30 plus a negative 18i a plus b i. 
Alrighty, let's do one where there's a little bit more involved here. Here we've got a true A plus B I times C plus D I. So it's kind of obvious we're going to have to do some foiling here. So first we're going to multiply the real parts together. Then we'll multiply the real to the imaginary part of the second complex number. Then we move to the next term. We will multiply the imaginary part of the first number to the real part of the second number. Then we'll multiply the imaginary part of the first number to the imaginary part of the second number. So a true blue FOIL method is happening right here. So we've got um, negative 4 times negative 4, that's positive 16. Then negative 4 times negative 2i will be a positive 8i. Positive 2i times negative 4 will be a negative 8i. And then the last jump there, 2i times 2i is 2i quantity squared, or 4i squared. So notice what's happening here. The inside and the outside terms of our FOIL method produce a positive 8i and a negative 8i. Those are actually going to cancel to 0. And then we're left with 16 plus 4i squared. Well, I already know I can substitute negative 1 in for, four, in for the i squared, so I really have 16 plus 4 times negative 1, which is negative 4 and 16. Um, and I made a slight mistake here because I have a 2i times a negative 2i. This should be a negative 4, so let's adjust that here real quick. Negative 4, negative 4, negative 4. So I really have 16 plus uh, a positive 4, which gives me 20 as the solution. Now, an interesting little side note to, to put on your handouts here, so make a little star off to the side. Um, an important thing to notice is that when we multiply complex conjugates, so whenever we multiply um, a plus bi to a minus bi, Right? Notice that these are, are essentially the same complex number. The only difference between the two is the sign in the middle. Whenever that happens, we end up with a real number, always. Because the middle um, two terms, that whenever we FOIL outside and inside, they're always going to cancel. Right? So we can do this off to the side here arbitrarily. A times A is always going to give us A squared. That's like the 16 in this problem. A times negative BI is going to be negative ABI. BI times positive A is going to be positive ABI. And then BI times negative BI is going to be negative uh, B squared I squared, kind of like this negative 4I squared was in the problem that we did. So these two inside-outside terms in the middle here, they are always going to sum to zero because they're, they're exactly the same value, just opposite in sign. So they will always be zero. And then we'll be left with a squared minus b squared i squared. And i squared, we always know, is negative 1. So this will be a squared minus b squared times negative 1. And a negative times a negative is a positive, so this will always end up being a squared uh, plus b squared. Kind of a neat property that happens when we multiply uh, complex conjugates. It actually is this exact prop property that we use um, to divide complex numbers. So conjugates are used to divide complex numbers, the goal being that the procedure always ends in a real number in the denominator. So notice that uh, since a and b are both real numbers, a squared is going to be a real number, b squared is going to be a real number, so their sum is also going to be an element of the real numbers. Um, so it's this property exactly that we use uh, to talk about quotients of complex values. So that's actually where we're headed next in these examples, A, B, and C for number four. So let's uh, pick a different color here and start with part A. To divide complex numbers um, in the form A plus B, I, the process is really just to multiply the entire quotient by a version of one, and that version of one is going to be the complex conjugate of the denominator.
So the denominator here is 4 plus 2i. That means I want to multiply um, 6 minus 3i and 4 plus 2i by the complex conjugate 4 minus 2i. It's exactly like the denominator, just opposite in sign, right? Instead of a plus sign, I'm going to switch it out and make it a minus sign. Now, just like what we do, did in the above little aside in blue here, right? Every time that we do this, whenever we multiply by the complex uh, conjugate, we end up with a real number in the denominator. That's the whole point of doing this. The product of complex conjugates is always a real value. So that's what we're doing when we're dividing complex numbers. We want to end up with a real number in the denominator. So let's go ahead and, and proceed and, and do this. Um, in the bottom, we will multiply the real parts together. So we'll end up with 4 times 4 is 16. The outside and the inside terms cancel, so we don't even have to worry about them. Then we just do 2i times negative 2i, which we know is negative 4 i squared. So not surprisingly, we just did this in the last example. i squared is negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 4 is going to be positive 4, so we end up with 20, a real number, in the denominator. Now the numerator takes a little bit more work because they are not complex conjugates, so we got to FOIL the whole thing out. 6 times 4 is 24. 6 times negative 2i is negative 12i. Negative 3i times 4 is another negative 12i. And then negative 3i times negative 2i is going to be a positive 6i squared. So we'll have 24 minus uh, 24i. Right, These are like terms, negative 12i and negative 12i will be negative 24i. And then we'll have plus 6i squared, which is really 6 times negative 1. So negative 6. Now the real numbers 24 and negative 6 can come together. So we really have 18 minus 24i in the numerator. And we're going to divide this by 20. Now according to our directions and also according to you know, mathematical convention, we typically don't leave our answer like this. We want to write it in... Um, the a plus bi form. So how we do this is that we just take each term of the numerator and divide it by the denominator. So I really just want to split this up and say that this is equivalent to 18 twentieths minus 24 twentieths i. And then if those fractions can be reduced, obviously we should reduce them. So 2 can come out of both the numerator and denominator of the first fraction, and we can say this is 9 tenths. And then um, 4 can come out of the second fraction, so this is 6 fifths, um, and then our coefficient i. So our, our end answer really in simplified and complex, uh, complex number form, a plus bi, we want to write it like the boxed answer at the end here. Okay, uh, a few more examples. How about 5 plus i divided by negative 4i? Well, the complex conjugate for negative 4i would be positive 4i. So that's what I'm going to multiply numerator and denominator by. In the denominator, I will get negative 16i squared. And i squared is really negative 1, so negative 16 times negative 1 is going to be positive 16. In the numerator, I have to do a little distributing. 4i times 5 is 20i, and 4i times i is going to be 4i squared. i squared is negative 1, so this is really a negative 4 plus 20i. And just like we did in the first problem, I want to write this in a plus bi form. So that means I want to divide each of the terms in the numerator by the 16 that is in the denominator. In other words, we're just going to separate it. Negative 4 over 16 plus 20 over 16i. So reducing like terms, this is going to be negative 1 fourth plus 5 fourths i. Okay. Uh, one more example, dividing complex numbers, 6 plus 2i divided by 4 minus 3i. I'm going to multiply numerator and denominator by 4 plus 3i. 
because that is the complex conjugate of the denominator. And conveniently, when we do this, we always end up with a real number in the denominator. So uh, first part's coming together, 4 times 4 is 16. Outside and inside terms are going to be opposites, 12i and negative 12i, so they will cancel. So the only thing left is to multiply the imaginary parts together. Negative 3i times a positive 3i is going to be negative 9i squared. Now we know i squared is negative 1, so negative 9 is really negative 9 times negative 1, or positive 9. So our denominator in this problem is going to be the real number 25. Okay, in the numerator, I've got a little bit of distributing to do, um, actually foiling. We will multiply 6 by 4, then 6 by 3i, 2i by 4, and then 2i by 3i. So we will get 24 plus 18i plus 8i plus 6i squared. So this will be 24 plus 18i and 8i are going to come together as uh, 26i. And then 6 times i squared is really 6 times negative 1, so that's going to be negative 6. And 24 minus 6, putting those real numbers together, we're going to end up with 18 plus 26i. And then to write it in true a plus bi form, we're going to separate the terms. So 18 divided by 25 and 26 divided by 25i. Um, 18 and 25 do not share any common factors, neither do 26 and 25, so this is actually as far as this one will also go. Alrighty, so that brings us to our last concept of this video, which is how do we simplify a larger power of i? Um, we've talked about, you know, i equals the square root of negative 1. We have, we have that down pat, i equals the square root of negative 1. We know that i squared equals negative 1. But how do we talk about like i cubed or i to the 25th? How do we simplify larger powers of i? Well, it's actually not as, as difficult as it first appears. Um, we really just want to use our rules of exponents to peel off factors of i whenever necessary. So really, we're going to be using the following two exponent rules. Whenever we have um, an exponential term that is raised to another power, so like a to the n times, or raised to the power of m, this is the same thing as a to the n times m. So we're going to use this property right here, this product in the exponents, um, to basically rewrite even powers as a product of two. That makes that simple enough. Um, we are also going to use the rule that says whenever we multiply two things at the same base, we add their exponents. Um, so this is going to be helpful whenever there is an odd power on i. So we're also going to use the rule that says b to the power of n times b to the power of m is b to the n plus m power. So these two things are going to be helpful whenever we're talking about powers of i that are either even, um, in which case we'll use a to the n times m, or when the power of i is odd and we use b to the n plus m. Okay, so just kind of keep those two in mind. Those, those two rules are familiar to us. Um, they will come in handy as we work through some of these examples. So let's do a couple to get a feel for this here. Simplify i to the power of 46. Okay, well, 46 is an even number. So that means I could rewrite 46 as 2 times something. In other words, I can use this rule that says i squared times 23 is the same thing as i to the 46, right? Because I know that when I've got an exponential term that is raised to a power, these two things get multiplied together, right? So what I really am doing here is separating the even power as a product of 2 times something. So i to the 46 is really going to be i squared to the 23rd power. Now, how is that helpful? Well, I know what i squared is. i squared is the number negative 1. So negative 1 to the 23rd power becomes super easy because negative 1 to any 
odd power is still going to be just negative 1. Okay, can we do it with an even larger number? i to the 400th power. Well, again, 400 is even, so I could rewrite this as i squared times 200, right? 2 times 200 is going to be 400. i squared is the same thing as negative 1, and I know that negative 1 raised to any even power, that means I'm going to have, you know, pairs of, of two negative ones together, that's always going to come out as a positive number. So this actually comes out as positive 1. Okay, one more, a little more complicated example. What if i is negative and I've got an odd power of i, right? The first two that we did, the, the exponents were even numbers. What if it's an odd number? Okay, well, let's, let's first work on this negative here. Negative i to the power of 13 is the same thing as negative 1 times i, right? That's how I'm getting the negative 1 to the 13th power. Well, if I have a product that is raised to a power, that 13 is really on both factors. So this is equivalent to saying negative 1 to the 13th power times i to the 13th power. Well, negative 1 to any odd power is still going to be negative 1, so that takes care of that. But it doesn't take care of this i imaginary unit. Okay, well, whenever the power of i is odd, this is where I want to employ this idea right here. If I just peel off a factor of i, it reduces the exponent, right? I could rewrite, I could rewrite this i to the 13th as i times i to the 12th. Right, because whenever we multiply things under the same base, we add their exponents. So i times i to the 12th is going to be i to the 1 plus 12, which is 13. I'm just peeling off a factor so that the exponent becomes even. And I know what to do whenever the exponent is even, right? I write it as 2 times something and go from there. So that's how we're going to proceed with this problem i to the power of 13 is really just the same thing as i times the i to the 12th. So we've got negative 1 times i times, now i to the 12th is i squared to the 6th power. i squared is negative 1. Negative 1 to the 6th power is going to be a positive 1, positive number. So really we just have negative 1 times i times positive 1, which ends up being negative i. Or we could say that this is, I guess, negative the square root of negative 1, but we all know what i is equal to. So all of these examples, uh, examples 1 through 5 and all the parts um, included therein, um, just kind of give us a taste or a flavor of working with um, complex numbers and you know, how to deal with this imaginary unit here, particularly the square root of negatives. Um, a lot of students, you know, think this is just an algebraic exercise, but it really comes in handy, especially in college algebra, where we're thinking about solutions to equations. Um, for, for example, if, if you were asked to solve uh, the equation uh, x squared plus 1 equals 0, right? That seems simple enough, like isolate the variable. We've done exercises like this all the time. But it sometimes happens that our answer doesn't actually occur in the real number system, like, like this one. If I tried to get x by itself, I would have x squared equals negative 1. Well, right here, this is already raising some red flags because there are no squared values that equal something negative. Right? When I square a number, it's always going to be positive. So if I'm thinking about solutions in the real number system for this equation, they don't exist. Right? If I go one step further and say, okay, to get x by itself, I'm taking plus or minus the square root of both sides. That isolates x on the left-hand side, but I'm still with, left with plus or minus the square root of negative 1 on the right-hand side. And again, in the real number system, this doesn't make sense. This is not a real number. We need this expanded uh, set of solutions, you know, to talk about equations that fall in this category. You know, technically they have solutions, but those solutions do not fall on the real number line.
So thinking about, you know, this complex number system um, has its has its use, has its um, purpose, you know, in a set of equations that don't have real number solutions. So just something to think about, something to, to chew on, and hopefully you enjoyed the video. I will see you next time.